Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, UCI Digital Humanities Exchange presents Introduction to Digital Storytelling using ArcGIS. We're going to wait another minute or two for more people to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this is the Digital Humanities Exchange presents Introduction to Digital Storytelling using ArcGIS. Um, so today we're going to learn about building interactive story maps for your research um, using digital storytelling methods um, using the ArcGIS platform. And the ArcGIS story map platform is a simple to use tool that lets you integrate maps, text, audio, images, and video into your um, narrative storytelling. So I just want to um, make sure that we highlight that um, there are ArcGIS accounts available for School of Humanities affiliates. Um, and in order to um, get one, you have to contact Dwayne Pack directly and we'll add his email to the chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Tatiana Bryant. I am the research librarian for digital humanities, history and African-American studies at UC Irvine. Um, and I'll let Ella introduce herself. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ella Turen. I'm a third year doctoral student in visual studies and with an emphasis on um, race and justice studies. And my work focuses on black feminist theory and visual culture. Um, and do you want me to keep, just keep going, Tatiana, or do you have something else? Oh, no, sure. Go ahead. Take it over. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I just want to also give a huge thanks to Digital Humanities Exchange um, and our committee, Ryan, Dwayne, Kirsten, Deanna, and um, especially Tatiana for inviting me to collaborate um, on this workshop today. And I'm really excited to share with you my work and to see what questions and to hopefully um, get more people interested in using uh, story maps because it's been a great process for me and just a great discovery to enhance my own work. So um, this project began with um, my experience working with young people in higher education in carceral settings and has resulted in the story map that I will share with you today. Now, this was my first experience with story maps, so just take that with a grain of salt. Um, so I also wanted to thank uh, Jonathan Gonzalez, Krista Christensen, and Kelsey Statham for their support in designing and conducting some of the research behind the project, as well as Professor Sorohan um, for her incredible support and guidance. So what I'll be doing today is sort of like walking you through my own map and my thinking around the storytelling and design aspects of creating the map, um, and then give you some thoughts about um, and, and show you some other maps that, that um, uh, friends and colleagues have made 
Um, and then hopefully Tatiana will also be able to um, help provide some of the more, um, a frame around the more technical aspects and, and also resources um, for you to um, tap into if you'd like to create your own map. So first I'd like to give you a little bit more context about my project so that you understand what you're looking at. And I will share my screen now so that you can um, begin to see the map itself. <clears throat> so this is um, abolition through art being seen at Rikers and Los Padrinos. Rikers Island um, and Los Padrinos are two jails that um, I worked at over the years. And this image behind um, that is that is framing the first slide um, is some is a, a huge poster board that my students created. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But this entire project really began um, in a class I took with Professor Sorahan. We began um, as a seminar reading the work of Angela Davis. And at the end of the quarter, we didn't want it to end. So we really continued meeting for the next two quarters effectively digging, digging deeper into this concept of abolition um, and each of us working on a project around that. And while we were all thinking about abolition from a variety of perspectives, we realized that a common thread was geography. And that's where the conversation around creating story maps came about. Mm -hmm. So we thought that um, if we could create the story maps and we would be able to connect all of our work together and have them be in conversation with each other, again, although they were touching on different aspects of abolition, but thinking about how geography figured into that. So this, this journey of storytelling, of reflection, of interrogation, it begins with a quote, quote from Angela Davis, whose work has taught me to stretch the boundaries of freedom, to engage in Black feminist practice, and to always be working towards abolition. And she writes that, I don't believe we can see radical change um, without art. Her quote makes me think about the work I and many other artist practitioners have facilitated in carceral settings. And one of my central questions in this work has been whether or not that work contributes to the work of abolition. Um, as an organizer on issues of mass incarceration, there is sometimes a sentiment that to do this work props up a system that is already oppressive, that abolition um, work that is necessary can only happen externally pushing against the system. But my question is, what about the people inside? What of, of the current status of the caged bodies whose desire for freedom is just as valid as the desire to dismantle the, the walls around them? Can we have the goal to free bodies and spirits and dismantle walls? And if there is a way to tackle these goals simultane simultaneously, should we not, as Miles Horton said, make the world by walking? So part of the research around um, this work involved Angela Davis's work, but I also looked at Nicole Fleetwood's um, recent book, Marking Time. And she talks about the way in which incarcerated people use various carceral aesthetics to create art. She's considering penal space, the geography of confinement, penal time, the temporalities of incarceration, and penal matter, the materiality of incarceration, including the body itself. And we can see how these elements are used to, um, by artists to express their ideals, goals, their pains, their frustration, their dreams, and their joys. And this gives us insights into spaces we on the outside don't have access to. So this geography of incarceration includes physical space as well as psychological space. And this is one of the things I explore in the different, um, the different elements that are in my story map. So I'm using the story map to chart my in interventions in juvenile halls on opposite sides of the coast. And you can see here, I've mapped out New York and Los Angeles. Um, to locate this, abolition, this abolitionist work in these spaces is allowing me to draw comparisons and interrogate what the work is doing. I bring this up because again, like I said, I will be focusing on the storytelling and design aspects of creating the map. And this is kind of the basic underpinning of what I was trying to do. So what follows is 
to document the work that I've done at Rikers and Los Padrinos or LP. And this is a collection of personal narrative as well as cultural production resulting from a class that I taught at both locations called Lyrics on Lockdown. The Lyrics on Lockdown was a project of the Blackout Arts Collective. It began as a national tour building awareness and organizing around the prison industrial complex. And then it morphed into a national movement growing from a summer tour to localized grassroots, grassroots movements, building campaigns year round um, to build awareness around the prison industrial complex. And then in 2004, I created the course Lyrics on Lockdown um, and I taught it at New York University and then um, at Occidental College. And it's been taught in other places by other faculty. Um, hundreds of college and incarcerated students have come together and the operative word is together because the classes actually take place in the jails. Um, and they explore um, issues of incarceration, um, issues, issues that sustain the prison industrial complex and ways to combat it. So what I found, so I'm gonna sort of walk you through now the entire um, site. And again, I want to stress that we pay attention to these different elements, right? So the narrative that is my are my own experiences and then sort of an analysis of that and also some of the research that I was able to do as well as some of the, stu the other students involved in this project. Um, and then the production of the actual artwork or other um, sort of like cultural artifacts that I pulled together to create the story. So first I started with the location of the two sites on opposite ends of the, the country. And the reason why I picked these two particular sites aside from the fact that um, I had experience in both of them was because they are actually the two largest jail systems in the country. So what does it mean to think about these two massive systems um, and the work that they're doing um, uh, and then the work that we were doing to sort of counter the, the prison industrial complex. Um, so this kind of sets up um, my questions and um, the ideas that I was trying to get at. And then the next thing I decided to include was this image of choose your green. This is actually an image that I recreated because it's a mural that is located at Rikers Island um, in the juvenile hall. At Rikers Island, there are actually New York City high schools located in the jail. And that's where we were doing our work. And in one of the um, trailers, that's where the classrooms were, there was this mural. And the first time I went there, I encountered this mural. I was really struck. It's just remained seared in my memory ever since. And um, all of us on this project were frantically trying to find a replica of this image. I tried to contact the school, contact the Department of Corrections um, to see if anybody had a photograph of this image and there, was, there weren't any. So I just had to recreate it from memory because I thought it was really important to, to show um, so what a counter image, um, a counter abolitionist image could be. Right, so there is art that is liberatory and there is art that is counter liberatory and this was one of them. This is an image that these young men were encountering on a daily basis, um, telling them that they basically had only two options, either become the property of the DOC or become the property of the military. And so I wanted to start there to think about what our work was doing against the backdrop of an image like this. So. I divided the rest of the site up into two sections, one focusing on um, Rikers, and you can see the map of the island here. Um, and located here are the places in which the different um, schools are located. There are a number of schools, and because Rikers Island is made up of about nine jails on the island. Um, and this piece talks about the different uh, media that you'll find on the other side. So this is a documentary that I created with my students um, that um, includes um, statistics about the prison industrial complex, complex interviews with the students. And also one of the things that we did 
um, was to do a person on the street um, segment. Um, there's one bus that goes to Rikers Island and we took that bus every week to go to the jail to do our work, to conduct these workshops. Um, and one day we decided to ask folks who were waiting for the bus to travel to Rikers to, um, to, to see their loved ones, what their experiences were. And then we also asked them to read poems from the students who we had been working with. So that's all in the documentary. And this part um, also talks about my, the first time that I ever stepped foot in a jail um, and what that experience was like for me. Um, and then what it resulted in, the kind of revelations that it resulted in, that my, my insights, my own experiences. And this is again, some of the art that was created um, by the students there. So the second part um, is, so as you scroll through, you can see that, um, you know, I've paired um, different pieces of narrative or analysis with an image or a video. Um, so the second piece is then looking at LP. Um, and again, um, looking, this is the, the sort of like aerial view of the jail and then locating within it a few different elements of what I was thinking about, namely that there are some murals here. This is a mural that was created by outside of my program, but it was created by the young people who were incarcerated there. And it's an image of Angela Davis. And since Angela Davis is um, so heavy, heavily represented in the work that I do, I wanted to have that representation there and think about how it was in conversation with some of the other work that I was doing. So this piece also is a narrative of the first time I encountered um, the young women at LP and what my experience was with them. And then another experience I had after I left, and it's kind of like a reflection and an analysis of the system itself and what the system is doing to these young people. Um, and thinking about what disruption looks like. What, what are we doing in these spaces, especially when for myself, um, I, was, I was going in to create a space where young people could create art and could be critical of the system that, they, that was incarcerating them. Um, and then finally, I, you know, to, to sort of like pull it all together and sort of like give my closing thoughts and analysis, I return to another quote by Angela Davis um, and use that to give sort of like my final thoughts. And I still see this as a work in progress because I have more um, artifacts and um, drawings and things that, that are in stories that I want to add to this. And I also, uh, there are also other people who have taught this course in a similar way. way. So there is, there is more that has been produced from the idea of this class that I would love to, to add to this. So what I found um, powerful about story maps is the ability to combine, to combine these number of elements side by side. So I have my personal narrative and my reflection about the work. I have my analysis of the work. I have my pedagogical methods and the work produced by that pedagogy. And I wanted to give an example of how this all comes together when I have presented this, what, what Story Maps is able to do in order to bring all of these elements together. And for that, I will go back to a section here um, where I talk about penal sound. So earlier I talked about Nicole Fleetwood's development of penal time, space, and matter. And so my intervention is to add another element to these carceral aesthetics, and I'm calling it penal sound. It can be considered, can, it can be considered as the sonic interventions in the carceral state. And we can think about this as, um, you know, uh, the podcasts that have developed or the voices of incarcerated folks being who, and, or people who are most directly impacted by the system. These projects invoke storytelling that reveals profound truth about the interior lives of people inside. Um, so one of the ways we did this in class was to create a human symphony. 
the students first engage in a discussion about the origins of hip hop. And here on the side here, I sort of recount what I'm telling you at the, at the moment. Um, we talked about the birth of hip hop, um, its socioeconomic um, political reasons for its birth. And then we went through and demonstrated each of the elements of hip hop. We actually embodied them or talked about them. The students illustrated them. And for beatboxing, we participated in a game called Vocal Jam. And with everyone in the circle, one student begins by creating a sound and each student in the circle then builds on that sound until everyone has gone. And this creates a human symphony, similar to how beatboxers like Dougie Fresh would create tracks completely dependent on the human voice or on um, their, their own body. Um, so I'm going to just play a little clip of this. Now, if you've ever um, gone into uh, a jail or a prison, you know that uh, recording equipment is not allowed. So I honestly do not remember how I got a recording of this, but um, it is a recording that I, that I happen to get inside. And these are my students and myself creating this human symphony. So here you can you can hear us creating the symphony. These are images, collages of things that my students have put together that I use as a backdrop for the sound. And then we still have the aerial view so we know where we are located. And here I have my own um, recounting of the story, um, sort of the activity that we did, um, which includes the pedagogy around how we want to um, think about sound and uh, in relationship to the carceral state. Um, and then also thinking about what this means, right? So I, when I think about this particular piece of sound, it reminds me of um, a chapter in Sadia Hartman's book, Wayward Lives, where she describes a group of women incarcerated at Bedford Hills um, Correctional Facility in New York. She writes that in December of 1919, the women of Lowell uh, Cottage made their voices heard even if no one wanted to listen. The New York Times describes the upheaval and resistance of Lowell College as a sonic revolt, a noise strike, a din, a din of an infernal chorus. Collectively, the inmates had grown weary of gratuitous violence and being punished for trifles, so they sought retribution in noise and destruction. They pounded the walls with their fists, finding a shared and steady rhythm that they hoped might topple the cottage, make the walls crumble, smash the cots, destroy the reformatory so that it could never be capable of holding another innocent girl in a jailhouse. The wailing, shrieking chorus protested the conditions of the prisons and insisted they had done nothing to justify con confinement. And the New York Tribune reported, the noise was deafening, Almost every window of the cottage was crowded with Negro women who were shouting, angry, and laughing hysterically. So although this didn't sound, uh, start out as a choreographed song, it naturally coalesced into this orchestra of rebellion. And almost a century later, here I was at Rikers Island with a group of incarcerated young men creating a human symphony using the same method banging on penal matter, disrupting penal time, finding penal space, and creating penal sound. So if we're thinking about how to tell the story, what I wanted was to be able to see the theory, the pedagogy, the, product, the practice, and the production side by side in a way that a paper or a traditional website might not be able to do. And as a visual studies scholar and artist, I felt it was important to engage as many of the senses as possible in this experience. And in addition, the spatial aspect of this project was important to locate this work 
in the specific site and draw attention to the paradoxes and the similarities between the two locations was also something that I wanted to consider. So I, I just wanna talk briefly about the process of creating the map, which was just that a process. Um, so in Professor Han's class, we began by writing personal narratives of our experiences. So these stories that I wrote were actually a product of the prompts that she gave us in the class. Once I saw a theme emerging, I began to think about the questions I wanted to ask. And I then dug into my own archives to find images and media related to the narratives I had written. And then in addition to this, I pulled quotes and ideas from the Angela Davis readings we had engaged with to think about how they were in conversation with my own experiences. I had a student who did research on the history of art at Rikers NLP, and then I was able to use some of that work as a way to also think about this idea of how it exists in these spaces, how it is created, how art is created, and how it is in conversation with the work that I have done. And after gathering all of this research, I basically mapped out my ideas in a document. And then I created an early draft of the work on a Google Sites, which I'll show you really quickly here. Um, but this was very limiting because essentially it's just kind of like a laundry list of the items that I showed you on the map. Whereas I feel like the map allows you, allows a collaboration between the different elements of the story. Um, when you do something on something like Google Sites, it's really one item after another. You are walking your, um, the, the person who is experiencing it, um, you're walking them intentionally through it, which is one way of doing it. But what I like about the map is that there is more freedom on the part of the user to decide um, which elements they're going to interact with on their own. So in, in my thinking, powerful storytelling is a way of getting a point across, but it also has structure. There's the beginning, there's a middle, there's an end in the same way we think about constructing our research. And what I was doing was combining these elements together, um, you know, to think about this idea of art and abolition. So finally, um, using story maps allowed the narratives and allowed analysis to flow more freely, in my opinion. Once I had an idea of how I wanted to, the experience to evolve, I was then able to work with um, Krista, who was one of the students on the project, to create a first draft. And she kind of trained me on how to actually pull things together. And once she helped give me that first leg up, I was able to then take what I had done before and think about how I was going to recreate it in story maps. So part of this is that I'm thinking of the user experience. I have a story that I want to tell I have an idea of where it's going to go and the elements that are involved, but I'm also thinking about how the user is going to interface with that. I have in mind my thesis and the questions, but um, how is the user going to encounter them? Is, it, is there overlap between the image and sound, between the image and text? When things are side by side, is the user able to choose what they want to engage with first? So you can think of it in, this, in a way as sort of like a museum experience. The wall text, the media, the artwork, um, even um, the catalog, they are all there, but the user has the freedom to choose what they want to engage with first. And in the end, they can still get the full experience even if they don't experience it in a linear way. Um, so I want to also show two other examples. Um, so this is one of my classmates, uh, Navi Gill, who created this site called the Carceral Valley. And she was the first, she was the person who introduced this idea of story maps to our class. And so what I want to show in these next couple of story maps is um, the ways in which the, the range in which you can use a story map. So Navi's um, site relies heavily on the maps aspect. I think mine is a little bit in the middle and then I'll show you one more that is more on the research and storytelling side. So if you look at um, Navi's site, 
called Sites of uh, the Carceral Valley, and it's focusing in on sites of incarceration. She um, she talks about okay, so she starts off with this map and um, pinpoints these different sites of incarceration, and you can literally click on one of them and get a deeper story. Um, you can either click on it on this side, on the left side, um, based on the place that you want to go, or if you have a curiosity on this side, you just want to explore the map. You can click on one of these and then it will zoom in um, and give you more details um, uh, about the specific site that it is. On this side, then if you click on um, this piece, you can get uh, a more detailed view of the facility. And so this way you are able to see the proximity of these sites. And then um, in her second um, section, she has video and um, sort of like more of a narrative and images about uh, the carceral valley um, and the jails and facilities that are located within it. And then the other site that I want to show really quickly is actually Professor Judy Wu's site on um, Patsy Takamoto Mink. And this is um, a site that she created about um, this feminist legislator. And so you can see here that the structure is a little bit more like a traditional website. There are landing pages that tell the story of, um, of Patsy uh, Takamoto um, and divides it up into different sections and includes images, um, and storytelling and information about her journey. So I'll stop here uh, and um, hopefully folks will have questions afterwards, but um, I hope you were able to get a sense of sort of my own process and thinking around this, which again, it's still a work in progress. But um, what excited me most about this map, especially as somebody who is again, a, a visual person, an artist, um, being able to combine all the different elements, not only the visual elements, but sort of like my, to, to position my theoretical um, uh, uh, thinking around how I wanted to arrange all of, all of the items that I had as archive, as narrative, this was something that was really exciting to me. And I felt like Story Maps allowed me to do that in a very innovative way. Thank you, Ella, that was excellent. Um, so now I just want to um, highlight some resources that we have available for um, anyone interested in learning about um, ArcGIS Story Maps. And the first resource I wanna highlight is a guide that was created by our um, GIS librarian, Danielle Kane. And I can go ahead and put the link for it in the chat as well. And this guide really works, uh, walks you through getting started with ArcGIS story maps and the various uses for them. So there's some tabs here um, with some video tutorials as well as screenshots, um, starting with the basics, how to create an account, how to start adding text and building your narrative, um, how to make maps, how to, how to integrate immersive features, if that's what you're interested in for your particular story. There's some tips here on how to finish a map and publish it, as well as um, several examples of story maps um, that do different things within them. There are also some resources here, um, things like um, graphics packages that you can download and integrate into your story map, um, as well as tutorials on how to um, integrate interactive images, um, for example. So this I will link in the chat now for you to take a look at. Um, and Daniel Kane and myself are always available to answer questions about how to use story maps. Next, I want to um, just talk about a couple of basics 
and just walk you through what the back end of ArcGIS story maps looks like. Um, so I'll highlight again that um, we have access to you see um, to story maps through the School of Humanities. So if you're a student, staff, or faculty um, at the School of Humanities, um, you can have access to a UCI um, School of Humanities account for ArcGIS story maps. You would just have to contact um, Dwayne Pack in order to create that account. Um, I'll show you a couple of maps and then walk through how to quickly create one. Um, this is the Illuminating the Edward O. Thorpe Papers collection. Um, and these story maps were created using um, archival materials from UC Irvine Special Collections and Archives from the Thorpe Papers. Um, so this is what it looks like on the back end. Once you're logged in, you have the option to create a new story map here. You have the option to create collections of story maps if you wanna build a narrative using individual story maps. And then you also have the option to create um, dedicated themes, um, which is where you'll control the aesthetics of your map. So things like font size, um, font type, color, background images, um, et cetera. That can be controlled if you create a, a theme, one or more themes. Um, if you'd like to create a new story, you can go ahead and start from scratch or you can use um, any of these kind of quick start options that are um, more interactive. Um, so creating explorer map tours, creating guided map tours that are sequential, um, using that sidecar imagery, which I think is pretty impactful, or you can just go ahead and start from scratch. So we'll go ahead and start from scratch and just scrolling through fairly quickly, you can add text to your story. Um, you can add different interactive features. So you might add text boxes. You might add buttons that will jump off and take you to another um, website, for example. You can add maps, images, image galleries. You can incorporate video files and or audio files. You can embed um, code from other websites for from like YouTube, for example, if you'd like. Um, as well as features such as swipes or timelines. And then of course, there are some immersive um, features you can also include, including the maps, the sidecar again, or slideshows. So what I'd like to do is just take one of our existing maps apart here a little bit and show you what it looks like. So this was generated using a theme. And of course we have title, we have subtitle, we have author information. Um, you can create um, a different, uh, in the header here, different um, chapters for this particular story by naming these um, headings. And then you can add different interactive features again as well as um, links off of the site. Um, so what I, well, I'll, we have about 20 minutes left, so I'll pause right here and give us the, I guess, a couple of minutes to one, ask Ella specific questions about her project to um, go through the chat and the Q&A and see if we have specific questions about the functionality of story maps, things I, I can answer now. Um, and then for the last couple of minutes, I'll um, share some resources for you on how to get help with starting to use story maps. Um, and if you have questions about even just thinking through your own research, um, your own research projects and how you might wanna incorporate um, GIX um, or um, digital storytelling into your own research projects, I welcome you to just add your thoughts to the chat and we'll, um, we'll we can also kind of brainstorm here and now um, since we're all in the space together. Um, so Ella, there is a question in the Q and A about, um, specifically about the class you mentioned that you had taken during the fall quarter and then you continued 
as a group on your own, um, essentially kind of like a Black geographies kind of reading group or working group? Um, is that something that um, one has continued or is that something that can be um, brought back? What do you think the options are for that? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, we didn't start off as, um, as sort of like uh, having, having uh, the story maps as uh, a way for us to uh, showcase our work that came about as part of our conversation of how we would uh, thread together our different projects. Um, and as I had mentioned, geography seemed to be something that we had been talking about a lot. And so this, ma this made the, GI the story, uh, uh, ArcGIS story maps um, seem like a really interesting way to actually position all of that. So it's not as if we started out uh, in that way. And I don't know if there are other classes um, that use, because uh, Deanna also asked this, this class about whether there, uh, this question about whether there were other faculty or grad, grads that have integrated story maps into their classes. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing maybe, <laughs> um, especially I would, I would think in the social sciences, um, which is why I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in um, how the humanities can better use this resource because a lot of the classmates that I were, that I was with in the class with, they were in the social sciences. But I think it's a really useful tool for humanities scholars to be able to combine all of these different elements together. Um, so I don't, I haven't come across um, a Black Geographies reading group or um, group that is using mapping, but I think it would be a great idea and maybe something um, the School of Humanities or the Center for Humanities or DHX could support. Um, so we have another question um, in the chat. Um, this is coming from Rachel. I'm interested in doing a project like this in my autoethnography course. Any tips for how to coordinate such a project with students? Right now, I feel like my class is deep in personal narrative terrain, but they are clearly itching for more collaborative work. Um, so maybe talk about how you um, would approach this individually versus collaboratively um, with students. And I also have a couple of other questions for you about your process. Yeah, so this is a great question. A great question, and um, one of so I would say a couple of things that help facilitate our work is the use of more technology. So we had we actually had a Slack channel. We still have a Slack channel, um, and we use that to um, uh, sort of like have the converse keep the conversation going outside of class, um, and it allowed us to have dedicated workspace for messages for collaborations for documents this is where we would post our notes about the readings um, and it was it was really great in terms of facilitating a dedicated space outside of all of the other spaces that we had just for this project so I would say like that would be one way of doing it and then the way that the our lab evolved was it started off as a graduate seminar but um, in the last two quarters Professor Han um, also had undergraduate students um, come come to the class to be in collaboration so we essentially each grad student was also paired with undergrads and we got to work with them on different aspects of our project um, and we one of the interesting ways that this also happened was um, in rotation meaning, um, so we would we would have we would be paired with um, one or two undergraduate students um, every three weeks. So um, that way we got to know a lot of the students in the class, but they also got a chance to work on things that were interesting to them. They sort of like listed out the things that they were interesting in interested in, and then they were paired with the projects that we were working on. And so I thought that was a very fruitful collaboration. It forced us to kind of be um, very um, focused about what we, the, the outcomes that we wanted and the work that we wanted to produce. 
but it was just enough time for also for us to also get to know the students and what was interesting. So for them, it was a very short term project um, because they were moving on then to the next person's work. But for the grad students, we were working long term on one specific project. So we got to, you know, we had to really think about what could a student do in three or four weeks time um, that would contribute to our the larger goals of our work. Um, I have a couple of other questions um, that, have that have come in. Um, this is coming from um, Elizabeth. Um, thank you for sharing your powerful research with us. Do you use story maps to engage with the families of the people who are cur currently incarcerated or with organizations that are working to support them and their families? How can story maps serve as a platform to support abolitionist work? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Elizabeth. I, I haven't gotten that far, um, but it's a great idea. And I think this, so this is a tool that I've been thinking about in my, in, in with my scholar hat on reflecting on some of the organizing work that I did before. But as um, I move forward, I could, I could see it as a tool that organizers use themselves, um, especially thinking about abolition, which is something of a hot topic right now. Um, and it's great that it's being explored and we're, we're challenging ourselves to think more deeply about it. But I could see a map being created uh, that, that um, locates abolitionist work across the country and helps them be in conversation with each other. I think one of the things that I learned from being from participating in the Lyrics on Lockdown tour originally when it was a tour is that we got to be sort of like in interlocutors with different organizations in different cities that were doing similar work. So we not only could help them be in conversation with each other if they weren't already doing that, but one of the most important things that we could do was to help people in that city be connected with those organizations. So I could see a story map being used in that way to not only document the work that's happening, but then to help connect other people to the work that's happening so that they can also be engaged, not just in the conversation, but in whatever actions um, are, are happening. And I think also in, in this time when we're sort of thinking more deeply about what abolition means and thinking about how much resistance there is against that, something like a story map that really helps show what abolitionist work is, how it is happening in different places can help sort of like demystify what abolition is. Um, so I do want to ask if anyone um, who's attending has any experience with using story maps. Um, feel free to add that experience to the chat and when we can talk about it as well. Um, I do want to ask, what are some of the like challenges of using this platform that you've encountered? Um, well, there were some technical um, glitches early on because as I mentioned, I had never used it before. So actually one of the students was the one who created and we had a really hard time giving me um, sort of like editorial rights to it. And I still don't fully own the map because I didn't create it. So there are some like quirky things with story maps in that way on the technical end. Um, and then just like anything else, you know, it was sort of like um, learning a new visual language. So some of the elements are there, like if you know how to build a Google site or a website or, or something, or even if you have put together a PowerPoint, some of the elements are the same, right? So you can cut and paste things, you can, you know, click on this thing that tells you what it's going to do and it builds it for you. So there is there is potentially um, uh, a learning curve in understanding and being able to really master the technology. It's not depending on your um, sort of like uh, past interface and level of, of of interface with technology. It doesn't have to be a huge leap, but I think more importantly is not just 
sort of like mastering the technology, but because stor the story map um, is so different in terms of how it pulls together the different elements, it's really sort of like thinking more expansively about how all these things work together. Again, that you're not just putting a laundry list of items one after another for somebody to experience, but you're thinking about how one thing is going to be positioned in relationship to another and how that, what, what the person's experience, you know, for instance, zooming in and out of something is that, that might be new for somebody who has never encountered a story map, what that experience is gonna be like for them. Is it going to be distracting and um, take away from the story that you're trying to tell or is it really going to enhance the story that you're trying to, to, to tell? So I think that's the bigger leap is sort of like shifting how we think about um, presenting our work and telling stories uh, and the, the technology is just the tool that we're using to do it. Um, I think that's a great point to bring up the limitations of various platforms. So you mentioned creating your skeleton site initially using Google Sites and just um, how limiting the functionality of, of it was as far as the story you were trying to tell. Um, and even ArcGIS story maps, I think it's um, a great platform, um, but there is some user experience kind of tweaks that they could definitely implement to improve it. But it's definitely a good idea to just go ahead and dive in and um, just again, start playing with it, start playing with the features and the functionality um, and experimenting and creating things on your own. Um, I, I will say another limitation that I will add even though we're promoting the, um, the platform here during this particular session, um, is ArcGIS is proprietary. It's owned by Esri. Um, so kind of the same issues you mentioned around, well, how do I transfer access? How do I um, make this map sustainable? How do I use it for um, various abolitionist purposes? Um, it's still a proprietary company. It's proprietary software. Um, so while we're using these like platforms for our own ends, we still kind of have to think, uh, keep that in mind as far as even just the sustainability of the maps we create on it. So that would be part of your, your sketch or plan. What will I do with this map after? Am I going to, um, export it as a PDF? Am I going to recreate it on another platform that's more open? And you have those options here, um, with ArcGIS to print and export and everything else um, and share as, as widely as you'd like. Um, I do wanna highlight a couple of things since we're kind of running up to the end of the session. If you have questions about how to use um, ArcGIS story maps, you can always contact UCI's Sigil Scholarship Services um, and send us an email. Again, you can email me um, and I'm listed here on our site. You can also email Danielle Kane, and we will um, work through your questions with you on how to represent your research on the platform. I also want to highlight that this is um, GIS week um, internationally, and across the UCs, we've put together um, something called UC GIS week which includes a number of different workshops that you can, that are free, that you can register to attend um, and presentations on how um, different UC students, faculty, librarians, and more use GIS in their own research, teaching and learning. Um, so the conference schedule is live and we have um, a full day of it. Uh, well, we have another hour of it soon um, at three o'clock. And then we have another full day of it tomorrow. And then of course, all of these sessions are recorded and will be available via the UC GIS um, Week YouTube channel. Um, so with that, if there are any final questions, um, feel free to grab Adam to the chat now. Um, but Ella, I definitely wanna thank you for sharing your work with us here today. Um, it was absolutely amazing, the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you all for your um, attendance and your participation and your questions. Um, Ella, do you have any closing words? 
Um, no, just thanks for, again, um, allowing me to share my work. And if anybody has questions or, um, you know, I, I, I can help a little bit. <laughs> so um, I'm definitely happy to, to help folks uh, with whatever they'd like if they are thinking about starting one of these up. And I'll put my email in the chat if you want to um, contact me afterwards. Thank you. Yes, both. Well, Ella, while you're doing that, um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat myself. Um, and that is just to encourage all of you just to keep up with what DHX is doing. We have more events like this coming uh, for winter um, and spring. So um, we'll be updating those within the next few days to a week here um, on our events page. So, you know, uh, ways of using digital technologies in the classroom, thinking through visual studies and art history, um, library sciences, things like this. Um, check our site and more will be posted um, in the coming days. So check that and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.